This is Joe Galloway conducting an oral history interview with Robert Bartko on February 28, 2020 at 10.30 a.m. We are located at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Sir, before we begin, could you please state and spell your first and last names for the transcriber? My name is Robert Bartko, R-O-B-E-R-T, B-A-R-T-K-O-W. Thank you. Before we talk about your time in Vietnam, I'd like to get a little biographic information. When and where were you born? I was born uh, November 14, 1944, and I was born in uh, Bronxville General Hospital in New York or Yonkers, New York. I don't remember which. Mm -hmm. Who were your family members? Well, my mom, uh, Deanne, and my father, Walter, who was a decorated World War II hero. And then I had uh, two sisters. The oldest one is Marcy, who unfortunately passed away last year. My younger sister, Jean, and then my brother, John. Uh, I'm the oldest of the four. Where did you grow up and go to school? Well, I grew up, uh, as a little boy, I was in, in Yonkers, New York. And then we left and we went to a place called Key Biscayne, Florida, and I spent three or four years there. And then we moved to Maryland, which is where I call home, actually. Home, huh? Yeah. And, what uh, town? Well, when we first went up there, it was Lewisdale, but then once I graduated from high school, my mom and dad finally bought a home in Rockville, Maryland. So I mm -hmm. call Rockville, Maryland you home. You call Rockville home. Yeah. <coughs> How did you come to enter the military? Well... You know, times were kind of rough back then, and I thought the country needed uh, the country needed people like me uh, what to come fight the did war. Did you finish high school? And I finished high school in 1962, and I graduated from the University of Kentucky in December of 1967. All right, you ROTC? No, no. Strictly officers candidate school, and then the basic school, and then Vietnam. Well, the Vietnam War was rolling good by the time you graduated college. Yes, it was. It was. Uh, uh, so you were making a move to enlist in the Marines and go through OCS and all of that stuff with the full knowledge that you were going to war. Yes, I, I very much anticipated going to war. In fact, they, uh, I, I I attempted to play college football at the University of Kentucky, but uh, I wasn't that good, so I never got on the field. But just prior to leaving uh, the basic school, they tried to get me to go play f football for the Quantico Marines, and I said, no, I've had enough football. It's time for me to do my real job, which was to go to Vietnam. Now, when did you go to Vietnam, and how did you get there? Uh, Where did you land? Okay, I left uh, Traverse Air Force Base, uh, just outside San Francisco, and we Civilian flew. Civilian charter? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, I believe so. And I, I don't remember the direct route. I know we ended up in, in uh, Okinawa for a couple of days. But I, I think my exact time that I set foot in Vietnam, which was in Da Nang, uh, was September 7th. And then I left September 15th, the following year, 1969. Right. So you missed Tet. Yes, I did. No, you didn't need to see that, I no, guess. No, I saw enough people die. But, uh, my, my tour wasn't as tough as some of the Marines in 67 and, and obviously the uh, first half of uh, 68. They paved the way, and they, they paid a heck of a price. And, now, at I, this point, you're a second lieutenant. Yes. And you're assigned where? Well, I landed uh, in Da Nang, and I couldn't believe how hot it was when I got off that jet. And then they put us on a, uh, I believe it's a C-130, and they flew us into, into uh, Dong Ha. Uh, and the next day, I went to, uh, I think it was Combat, Va Combat Base Vandegrift. Uh, and uh, spent one night there, and then the battalion was heli helicoptered in on a uh, on an assault, and they got hit. And they got hit real hard. They had a lot of people killed and wounded from mortars, 
And the next day is when I actually arrived and uh, became... At the battalion. Yeah. Uh, no, I actually arrived at, at Golf Company and was assigned the 1st uh, Platoon, uh, the commander of the 1st Platoon, and my predecessor was a Lieutenant Bob Wynn. And when I got to my platoon, I only had 20 men. That, that was it. There's supposed to be 40. Mm. Uh, and within three days, I had a medevac, my, my platoon sergeant. He had malaria and a couple of other young Marines. Uh, they were short. They had like five, six, seven days left in Vietnam. And, I, you know, the platoon sergeant said, Lieutenant, these guys have been good, good Marines. Can you get them out of here? So I did. Uh, and I think. After the first three days, it was only 17 of us plus 17 me. 17 of you left. Yeah, that was it. Did you get reinforcements? Yeah, but it took a long time. It took a long time. So here you are with less than half strength. Yeah. Uh, when did you go on your first operation? Well, it was then. I mean, right I, then. Yeah, right then, the there. The that, that was it, yeah. We went all the way... Uh, was part of the breakout of Quezon, mm -hmm. and a, uh, uh, the Second Battalion, 26 Marines, went all the way to the Ben High River. That's bad country up there. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, Our enemy something. artillery and rockets. Yeah, and we did get hit with artillery one time. That was the only time I faced it. It, it was, uh, it was something else. your training prepare you for what you met in Vietnam? Yes. Uh, the, the training was excellent. I, I believe, Joey, that uh, because of what happened during Tet, that they, they kind of squeezed it. Uh, instead of six months at, at the, the basic school, I think we had a, a, around five or maybe even a, a couple of weeks less than that. Uh, so they were pumping them out. Yeah. And it, you know, it prepares you as much as you can be prepared, but there's nothing like a firefight. There's just no, no other way to describe it. And it, uh, you know, I, I landed in the Nang at 48 hours or 24 hours later, I was in a firefight. And that's, that was something else. Yeah. I, th I thought I'd get to ease into it. No. No, no. There was no easing into it. Walk right off the cliff. That's right. How old were you at this point? I was 23. 23. Most of the men I commanded were 18 and 19 years of age. What, what were the living conditions like? Abominable. <laughs> I mean, we were in the same utilities for something like 60 to 65 days. Whoa. Uh, no, hot, no hot food, no th cold to drink. Never got back to any kind of a base camp where you could get a shower or anything? Yeah, no. Okay, I was talking about the first operation when we went to the Ben High River. Yeah. Uh, like I said, we were the, I was part of what was known as the 9th Marine Amphibious Brigade, which was basically made of the 26th Marine Regiment. So we made uh, helicopter assaults off of ships. Ships. Uh, that's right. So after the 65 days, we were kind of banged up, and we went back to the ship. Uh, I don't remember which one. It was one of those World War II aircraft carrier. Yeah. And uh, we would clean up, and I, I think we were there for about five or six days. Bang, and then we went out again, and we made out. another helicopter. So, uh, you know, I don't think I spent more than, I might have spent 10 days at a place called Hill 41 outside Da Nang. I might have spent 10 days in 10 or 15 days in the High Vaughn Pass. But other than that, we were always in the bush chasing the bad guys and hoping we found them before they found us. Describe your friendships with and your impressions of, of your fellow Marines, those that were in your platoon and those around you. The, uh, the young Marines, for the most part, were extraordinary. Uh, they did everything I asked. Uh, they worked hard. They fought hard. Fortunately, we didn't have that many firefights, but I had confidence that they, they could get the job done. They were young, like I said, 18, 19 year olds. Uh, the, uh, the ones especially in the first part of my tour were, 
because we had that project, I think it was Project McNamara, where he we brought in 100,000. That's right. And we started Did you get getting some of those. Yeah. Oh. And that, that was. That was the, the cruelest thing our government ever did. They yeah. were taking people who were just barely past functioning <clears throat> idiots. Well, it, 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 it's just the ones that were drafted in the Marine Corps. One of the things about the Marine Corps that, that made me want to join the Marine Corps uh, was I considered them the best. But also, like I said, my dad was a decorated World War II here. He, he was also a paratrooper, although he, he was awarded uh, his uh, medals for being a, a, a waste gunner in a B-24. I'm not jumping out of a perfectly good airplane with a sheet over my head. So that ruled out all of that, and I didn't want to— if that plane ain't on fire. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to deal with the indigenous person, personnel, so I, I didn't want to go special forces or, or airborne or any that kind of stuff. So I, I knew the Marine Corps is what was for me. And uh, the ones who were there voluntarily were extraordinary. Some of the ones we got a little later— Quite honestly, we're a pain in the butt. Hmm. Draftees, they used to yeah. go down the line and every tenth man was going to the Marine Corps. Uh, I didn't know what the number was, but excuse me, Joey, I should have thought of that. And the other officers, you know, the officers I were with were great. I mean, we're all, all volunteers, all college educated, all trained the same way. I don't know whether anybody realized it, but all Marine officers are trained in the same place. They go to Quantico for officers candidate school and they stay at Quantico, which I think about six or seven months called the basic school. The basic school. I used to I used to have a farm at the back end of the Quantico Reserve and on the coldest, wettest, snowiest night of the year there'd be flares and artillery and I knew there was a basic class out there crawling yeah. through the mud on their bellies. Yeah. <laughs> Been there and done that. <laughs> God, there was one time it was so cold. Oh, man. My wife had complained because the artillery would shake the windows in the sure. old farmhouse sure. and I'd say, nah, darling, that's the sound of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. You form friendships with men from different racial and social backgrounds. Well, or was there that much diversity at that point? Well, in terms of diversity, I think I had the uh, the privilege of commanding maybe th three or four African American Marines. Uh, we had no diversity at all in the officer corps that I saw. Uh, not in golf company. If it was in the rest of the battalion, I simply was not aware of it. Yeah. And. Uh, but your Marines, they were fully integrated and yes. part of the team. Yes. Yes, I would. Uh, uh, I would uh, make make sure that there wasn't. Like I said, I only had three or four African Americans, so there was no African American squad or African American fire team. They were integrated with the rest of the Marines, and as far as I was aware of, we did not have any problems. Yeah. Uh, we, they, I called them all green. I said, I don't want no black, no white. We're all green with a green machine. Green. That's it. Because well, we had I think green the utility. racial problems were more in the rear with the gear. Yeah, I had, uh, yeah. It don't sound like you guys had any much time off. But if no. you did, what what did you do? Well, we would we would backload to the ships, uh, and usually those were very short, two or three days at the most, and then we would go out on another operation. So get when you, your get you a new set of fatigues, yeah, get yeah. your bug bites treated, uh, get all all the medical stuff taken care of. Make sure we we cleaned and all our weapons on a over Navy and over again. Ship so you don't even get the two cans of hot beer. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw that, but I, <laughs> I know there are fellow service, and I, I know we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the Navy, but <laughs> the Navy didn't do much for me as far as I was concerned. <laughs> So that's what we did. Like I said, we were the 
so-called theoretical strategic reserve, but all three battalions of the 26 Marines, we were in the field almost all the time. Do you recall any memorable holidays during your tour, Thanksgiving, Christmas? Yeah. Yeah? I remember my birthday. Uh, we were surrounding a, uh, a leper colony. Oh, my God. So uh, we had to go in there and see if there were any bad guys. We didn't see any bad guys. Uh, I remember Christmas, we were on an operation, and we got this quick order. They're going to take us back out, uh, back to the ship. And I think we did it on uh, the morning of December 24th. And then on the afternoon of December 26th, they re reinserted us. They just, I assume they just didn't want us uh, out there, in, out the there in the bush on Christmas. You they know, risk anybody's life. Yeah. Or something. Oh yeah. Yeah. And on Thanksgiving, they they flew us in a, a hot meal uh, as best they could, and uh, the OV tens were about a, a click away. They were firing, so there must have been bad guys somewhere, but we didn't see any. Uh, and I don't remember biggest fireworks. I think it was sometime in July is when the bad guys hit the Da Nang. Uh, Ammo dump. Oh, blew up the ammo Yeah, dump. yeah. And we were in the High Vaughn Pass. We were looking down. I must admit, I think I don't know if anybody got hurt, but it was kind of a, it was kind of a pretty sight. Uh, I suspect from yeah. up there in the High Vaughn it was, yeah. but I, I don't know. I don't remember whether anybody got killed or not. I don't remember much about it. It sure was a hell of a blow, though. Yep. Did you serve in that same I Corps area? The whole tour? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we were in I Corps from, uh, like I said, Camp Vandegrift, which I think is fairly close to the Laotian border, then to the Ben High River, and then as far south as the Batangan Peninsula, which I believe is where they ran Operation Starlight. And right. we, we re ran Operation Starlight. South of uh, Da Nang. Yeah, south of Da Nang. Actually, I think it's a little south of Chulau. Or somewhere down uh, there. I can't remember the name. I can remember Anwa and Da Nang. And, I can remember well, that place was booby trapped to a fairly well. Yeah. The thing I was amazed at is the it was hedgerows, uh, and they had the foxholes in the corners. And as we were going, fortunately there was no bad guys there. But I kept thinking to myself, boy, if these guys come up in these corners with automatic weapons, this is going to be a nightmare, because you know we're basically in a box. Yeah. Now Starlight was sixty-five. Yes, I think it was yeah. the first major operation yeah, that the Marines the first, ran. First Marine major yeah. operation yeah. Uh, in 1965 yeah. in the summer. Yeah, I believe yeah. so. Yeah. <coughs> Can you describe for us the quality of the leadership in your outfit as high up as you could see it? Well, I had an excellent company commander uh, when I uh, when I got there. Uh, uh, his name, I think, was Jim Seal, and he was from Bogalusa, Louisiana. And then after that, uh, he he uh, rotated back, uh, you know, out of, back to the world. And uh, we had another first lieutenant take over, and he, he and I got along fine. We still communicate a little bit. And then when we were taken to the Philippines, uh, we had a new company commander. He was a captain. Three captains came in, three or four captains came in. And, uh, of course, all the first lieutenants were no longer going to be company commanders because uh, these guys were captains and they needed to be a company commander. Uh, so uh, they were having some issues in the 81 Mortar Platoon Commander, so they, they sent me over there, and I was there for about uh, two months, and then I rotated home. Mm -hmm. But this was in the Philippines? Yes. Yeah. yeah you know, I, I took over in the Philippines and trained them and cleaned up some things, and then uh, then uh, we went back in, in country. Mm. And then I think on, like, September 14th, uh, 15th, I, was, I left. Do you recall any of the named operations in which you participated? Hmm. Right at the moment, Joey, I can't. I, I just, 
I can't think of them. <laughs> I'll think of them as soon as this is over. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Describe any cutting edge technology or science that that you ran across during your time in Vietnam. No, not that I can recall. Good old basic marine stuff. Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, you know, we, we wanted to travel light. Basically, we would load them up with ammunition, load them up with food, extra pair of socks, some medical stuff, and then fill the canteens and off we went. Low tech. That's it. Is this? <laughs> Describe for us your most vivid memories of your tour in Vietnam. Describe mm -hmm. for us the best day you had. I can remember the worst days. Well, that's the next question. Uh, the, the best days. When you wake up in the morning and you're still alive, it's that that's a good day. Well, that's that's a good day. Uh, the best day, of course, was rotating back to the world. Leave it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it was it was it was also bittersweet. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, you knew I, you were leaving all those guys. That's were right. Still doing it. That's right. And uh, that that's an odd feeling. You're glad for yourself, but at the same point in time, you're saying. Can can someone new take care of them as well as I did? And, you know, that was the first important thing was to accomplish the mission. The second thing was do it in a way that you didn't just risk every all those young men's lives. Yeah, because uh, literally you I was responsible for all those lives. That, uh, if I extend, am I likely to live long enough to see it through? Well, the only way I would have extended is if it had been as a company commander. But th th I really was not going to extend. Uh, you know, I knew what was going back home. Uh, my mother left when I when I left. She had all brown hair. When I got back, she was all gray. And like I said, we almost lost our father in World War II, or my, you know, her husband, my father. So uh, enough's enough. She um, paid a hell of a price, and she didn't need to do go through any more. Describe for us the worst day you had during your tour. There were two of them. We were out in an operation, and it was outside Da Nang, uh, somewhere near Gono Island, as I remember, which is a real bad spot. It was euphemistically called Arizona Terry. It's a free fire oh, yeah. zone, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I sent out a listening post, and it was three young Marines, and I told them where to go and positioned them and all that kind of stuff. And sometime, I think between 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning, artillery came in. And I got this message from a Marine who was obviously desperately wounded, so I immediately went to the spot, <clears throat> uh, got a couple other Marines with me, and somehow, some way, it was a friendly fire incident. And these two 105 rounds, well, they were they five landed. clicks offline. They just unbelievable landed right on top of them, and they were they were all dead. And I went to uh, you know kind of roll one over, and I, I, I think my hand went all the way through to the dirt. Uh, it, that, that was just awful. That was that was a bad day. Chaplain came out the next day and <laughs> he brought us a bottle of booze. Hmm. So, you know, I passed that around to the troops. And uh, I, n I never could figure out how you could do that. And no one ever, there was never any final explanation as to how in God's name you could fire artillery like that. They, they were H&I fires, harassment and interdiction fires. But they were so far offline, uh, it was unbelievable. And then the I, really I, the other one. I interviewed a, a Marine, same Arizona Territory, a uh, pair of Air Force F-4s somehow decided to drop their ordnance before going back. Their target hadn't appeared, 
and they punched the pickle switch on a couple of 500 pound bombs and dropped them right in the middle of a company of Marines. Killed 30 people. Oh God, that 500 pounders blew that. Fortunately, I, that was one thing you were so, you were so cognizant, at least I was so, and if I was scared, that's what I was most scared about. I, I'd already made my peace that if they got me, they got me, but I didn't want to make a mistake. I didn't want to call an artillery in the wrong spot. I didn't want to call in a, uh, you know, the fast movers and have them drop bombs on us instead of them. Uh, you had to worry about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, in the jungle, especially up in the DMZ with the Triple Canopy Jungle. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the other worst day I ever had was, this was just outside Da Nang. We were working an operation with the uh, 1st Battalion, 7th Marines. And... Uh, it was during the daytime, and I heard this explosion. So I got my helmet on and my flak jacket and rifle, and just literally I sprinted to the other end of the uh, where the platoon was. And this young Marine, he was an African American Marine. There was a, there was a his machine gunner was beside him. He was wounded, and that kid had come back to Vietnam because he told me, I don't know whether it's true, that he was from West Virginia and his father had taken his money that he'd been sending back. So he elected to come back to Vietnam. And when my troopers would leave, I would tell him, do not come back to this damn place. Get out of here, be thankful, go live your life. And this was the only kid who comes back, so he was badly wounded. And what had happened is the The kid had pulled the cotter pin on his grenade oh. to the point where when he put it back on his flak jacket, it unleashed and the and the and the pin the pin was out and the spoon and he sympathetically dead in another another grenade. Joey, there was nothing left. Yeah. When I got there, it was like tinsel on a Christmas tree. That's all that was left. That that's that just blew my mind. That wasn't the West Virginia kid. Did no, it? he was he was lying on the ground. He'd been wounded from the grenades going off Next on the other young man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, that's how I found out what happened. I, uh, his name was Jordan. I said, "What what the hell happened here?" Yeah. And he he told me. And the, the young Marine, I think I think his name was Rice was his last name. And. Uh, I think he was actually from Cleveland, as I recall. Just gone, just disappeared. Just gone. Yep. And that happened one other time when we were we were running another operation. I was I was I think I was the fourth. We were crossing a river. And uh, there was an engineer, and there were two other guys, and there was a, a fac, and then there was me. Big boom. We, we never found anything. He was gone. Just he stepped gone. on, stepped on up. Obviously, it was a very large. It must have been a 250-pound bomb, and no one else could hit the fact. Had to be medevac. He was right in front of me, and somehow he got medevac. I didn't get. I didn't even get knocked down. I, you know, I, I knew something was wrong, but he got knocked down. And early on, I was on an operation, and a Marine lieutenant colonel triggered a booby trap 155 shell mm. and they you know they didn't get a handful of no there wasn't they, anything left that's right it's, it's it's hard for people who haven't seen that god awful stuff and thank god not many have seen it to realize people they get vaporized or whatever yeah. the heck the word is they're absolutely. gone absolutely so One those those the are the worst North days vietnamese colonels that fought us described it best he said we thought we were in a sea of fire and that none of us could possibly live, hmm. but somehow we did. Some did, yeah. Yeah. And I've seen them when they caught them on the wire and they hit them with the, the flame tanks. And that, that was an awful scene, too. Oh, the food gas? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just, it was them. I was glad it was them and not my, my <clears throat> Marines or any other Marines, but exactly. it's, not a, it's not a sight that you really want to 
See. Do you have any contact with our allies, the Australians, Koreans, New Zealanders? No, None sir. Of that. No, sir. They just weren't up there. Well, they may have been up there, but I never, I never saw you them. Never saw no. them. What about the Arvin? Did you have anything to do with I, them? I didn't have anything directly to do with the Arvin. We ran one operation, and uh, trying to think what those guys were called. They were, they were the children of Vietnamese officers that had been killed by the NVA. I can't remember the name of them. Anyway. Uh, they see, had a whole unit on them? Yeah, there was there was about twenty of them, and, and they were they were pretty good. They'd, and they'd, you'd think they'd have some motivation. Yes, and they did, uh, and they they went out and they didn't do things the way we did. They they went as a gaggle. I mean, they well, one grenade would have gotten most of them. Yeah. Uh, and they went into this spot, and you know we were kind of tailing along behind them. And twenty seconds in, they killed two of them, pulled them out of a spider hole. I said, okay, that's good. Yeah, uh, but it, it was interesting to watch them work because, like I said, you know, we would try and spread out the Marines, you know, three to five yards apart. Yeah, uh, we didn't let them all bunch up. We didn't. <laughs> they the, these guys were all just all kind of together, and they wa they went into this village, and that's what happened. I can't well, remember. I'd have walked behind them. Oh, that's them what we did. That's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what we did. And I can't remember the name. I mean, it's a shame because they were. They had, they had a reputation, and then at least the one time I ran across much. them. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the name of them. That's another thing I'll probably remember when this interview is over. Do you have anything to do with Vietnamese civilians, villagers, <laughs> townspeople, hooch maids, or anything like that? Uh, yes and no. Obviously, we would see them in the villages uh, when we were on operations. What'd you we would see the, the women villages? and the children. Uh, they use the term now third world. This must have been fifth world. Yeah. I mean, it was. I, I don't know how they would want to live like that. Uh, now, when we got around Da Nang in the High Von Pass area, it was different. It was. Yeah. In fact, the first time I saw the Arizona territory was, you know, kind no. of the low end of everything. Yeah. yeah. And up in the DMZ, you didn't see anybody. Uh, we saw them occasionally when we ran a couple operations along the coast, and all you ever saw was women and young children. Yeah. Uh, and most of the young children were little boys, five or six, little girls. You didn't see any 14, 17, 19 year old they men, that was for sure. No husbands or, you know, adult males. They were gone. Uh, hopefully they were fighting for the Arvin, but who knows. Uh, but other than that, no, I mean, the, the, the Da Nang was Freedom Hill. The f first time I saw Freedom Hill, I, I couldn't believe it. It was like a giant super Walmart. And I thought to myself, we're out there fighting a war and they're back here doing this. That kind of irritated me, but it was only one time. Uh, but the... Uh, what was located there, the PX and all that stuff? It was, it was just like a giant Walmart. Yeah, that's what it was. You could go in there and buy things. You could buy cameras. You could buy anything under the you sun. Buy a car. Have yeah, you could do it online. That's right. I I heard that. N not online, but you could buy it and have it waiting for you when you get back to the world. Yeah. I heard that. I obviously I didn't try. Uh, no, <laughs> I ended up I ended up getting a Dodge Charger when I came back. <laughs> so, uh, I think it was forty five hundred dollars, brand new. Brand new. Couldn't believe it. Now that. Now these cars are fifty thousand dollars. How much contact did you have with your family back home? Well, uh, mail call was a big deal. Uh, I don't know how these kids do it nowadays, with where they can talk to their their loved ones, their girlfriends, their wives, their mothers and fathers. Oh my! I think Every that single such day. Such a distraction. That's what I think. It, it, I would think that would be tough on a young Marine, a young trooper of any type, yeah. anyone in the military. The wife's when you're in a combat zone. there complaining that the, you know, the air conditioner broke or the washing machine don't wash. And, uh, well, I would think you'd get distracted. You'd be thinking about that when you're out in the bush. Yeah. And you can't do that can't and do not that. stay alive. Yeah, uh, so bad. mail call was a big deal. Uh, and we would do these cassettes. Yeah, little well, mini cassettes. Yeah, that's right. 
and uh, they would send them to me, and I'd play them. And then when I'd get back aboard ship, uh, you know, I'd send a couple back. Over and send it That's exactly right. So there was there was some of that, and it it was great. It was wonderful to get those letters and, and cassettes. But man, I wouldn't want to have been able to pick up a phone and talk to them every day. Uh -uh. You know? How much news did you get about the war you're fighting? About the troubles back home? Uh, well, I, I saw some of that, you know, before I left. And stripes, armed forces, radio. Nah. Places I went, there wasn't any armed forces, radio, and stars and stripes. Yeah. They, they, you know, you you wanted to travel light. It was food, water. Uh, ammo. ammo, lots of ammo. Yeah, I, you know, I used to have the kids. I shouldn't call them kids. Excuse me, the young Marines. Uh, you know, they they were instructed to carry 20 magazines, and uh, they had grenades. Uh, so weight was a big deal, because we humped everywhere. I mean, we did. Uh, we I weren't like the first air cav. The lower end, 20 magazines. Well, I carried 30 or 40. I don't know how you could do that. You must have, well, you were in the first air cab that time, so you got yeah. helicopter well, everywhere. We yeah, we would have to hump 10, 15 clicks uh, to do stuff, so uh, we, uh. we walked everywhere. Other than the initial insertion of the extract, we walked. And I used to love getting around the Army because they had the helicopter, so I knew if something went wrong, I could get the Nang dust off, and if the, could get a hold of the Marines, the Nang dust off would come in and take care. Yeah. Of medevacking my men. So where'd you get your news from then? I didn't pay much attention to the news. I, I, I there was nothing I could do about it. Uh, <laughs> my parents would tell me what was going on, like in the Super Bowl, or fortunately, what the University of Kentucky was doing in basketball more than anything else. Uh, I don't, I don't think I paid any attention to the news, Joey. It's yeah. You know, I was kind of locked in doing what I had to do to keep my men and myself alive and get the mission done. Is there anything I haven't asked you about that you'd like to tell the story of? That's a good question. Uh, I think people should understand the uh, speaking strictly about. My platoon and my company don't know anything about the Army or any of that other stuff. But the deprivation really was amazing. I mean, we would go out on an operation 40, 50 days at a time, and I'm not even going to discuss the sanitary conditions because there weren't any. Uh, you know, you drink that lousy water and have to put that halazone pill in there. Uh, you're in the same utilities. Everybody had to carry an extra pair of socks, so you might get to clean those every three or four days. The only shower you ever took is if you came across a waterfall. Uh, showering was an unbelievable luxury when we would get back aboard ship. And one time, hot I made water? hot water, hot yeah. water, uh. and it was always a hot shower. None of this stuff. Well, it was 100, 110 degrees outside. You want a cold shower? No, no, you want a hot shower. You want a hot. Uh, yeah. So the, and and you're humping every day. Uh, you know, you've got 60, 70 pounds on your back, and then you've got a helmet, a flak jacket, and four canteens. So, the first operation I was on was when we went to the. Uh, it was about, like I said, about 65 days, all the way up to the Ben High River. And when I left Okinawa, I weighed 182 pounds. When I got back aboard ship after that operation, I weighed 149 pounds. I'd had some sort of dysentery, and there's a young lady here present, so I'm not going to go into it, but I had jungle rot, dysentery. I had all of and, that. And yeah, <laughs> you, you know what it's like. Yeah. You know. And people need to understand just. Just try and get a person right now, other than a homeless person, God bless them. Just let them go three days without a shower. <laughs> See what that's like. Yeah. So these these young Marines and these young young Army soldiers and all, 
There ain't no showers no, out there. No, not, not in the places we went, that's for damn sure. So that would that would be about it, and they're tired. You're tired all the time. You know that, Joey. Yeah. I mean, you know, you just you have night ambushes. You have night at listening posts. Uh, you're on patrol at night, which is afraid to go out in away from everybody to have a crap because they may shoot you. When yeah. You come back yeah. In. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've hung my butt over more tree limbs than I'd like to talk about. <laughs> uh, but uh, that's uh, the uh, infantry. Yeah, <clears throat> but it's I. Uh, it was the greatest privilege of my life commanding the men of the first platoon of Golf Company, Second Battalion, Twenty Six Marines. For the most part, they were fabulous. Had a couple, and, but it was it was something. And my hats is off to them. Tell me about your eventual return home. You first went to Okinawa. Yeah, I went to near Kadena. Uh, I spent there three or four days, and like every other fool officer, loaded up on that uh, equipment, you know, stereo equipment, uh, reel-to-reel, all of that kind of stuff. Oh, and that, that was great. Brought that and back to the world. Of course, lost your sea bag. No, 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 my you sea bag was yours? fine. Yeah, my, I had You're no problem with it. the first Marine that yeah. I met who uh, actually got his sea bag back uh, in Okinawa uh, at the end of the tour. Uh, no, I, I had everything back. Every time when we would change ship, I don't. The first sergeant, and it's unfortunate I cannot remember his name. I can remember Gunnery Sergeant Nicholson because I always wondered whether he was he was all there or not. But he was a great guy. He once told me we were in a firefight. It was kind of dumb firefight because they were on one side of a river, we were on the other side of a river. They we couldn't see them, they couldn't see us, and we must have fired a hundred thousand rounds. And and I guarantee you nobody got hit. And he was walking down. I said, Gunny. Get your butt down here, man. You're going to get killed. I said, no, nah, Lieutenant, for me to get killed, I have to occupy, the bullet has to occupy the same space as I'm in at the exact right time. I thought to myself, that does not make sense. <laughs> <That's bad computing. laughs> yeah. Yeah, I said, that yeah, that, compute, that's man. true of everybody, Gunny. Get your butt down here. But So the first sergeant, I, fortunately I can't remember his name, must have done a great job. Because we would have our sea bag and everything, and we were not always on the same carrier. It changed. I mean, I must have been on three or four of them, the names of which, the only one I can remember is the Okinawa. So there you are, you're on Okinawa for a few days, yeah. buying your stereo reel yep. to reel, yeah. and uh, drinking too much, having too much fun. How long are you there? Three days, four? <sighs> Joey, I'm not going to swear to it, but it, it was probably between three and five days. And then we flew to Hawaii, and then we flew back into Travis Air Force Base, and so I arrived. Again on one of those civilian Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. When that plane took off from Da Nang, we, we were all crying, we were all cheered. Yeah. It was, that, was, that was a special day. That was mighty fine, mighty fine. You're not kidding. How about at the other end? You other end wasn't so great. Anybody being nasty? Yeah, there were there were there were a few, but I th fortunately I arrived like one o'clock in the morning, at Travis Air Force Base. Their night shift wasn't as active. No, they they, they were sleeping too, so uh, it it where, wasn't a pleasant where did time. Where you go from there? Was your was your time in the Marines done at that point? Oh no, no. no uh, you mean the night I arrived back in the world, yeah. or what I did? Well, from Travis Air Force Base, I had a good friend of mine who's still with me 55 years and yeah, he played nine years in the nfl a guy named bob windsor great great guy anyway he was playing for the san francisco 49ers and he his wife and his newborn daughter Lori, were in redwood city so i called betty which is his wife and i went by cab to see them and spent the night with them and at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm drinking scotch and eating bonbon cookies. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But, and the, that's my goddaughter, and she turned out wonderful. But, uh, and then from there, I went back to Maryland. I, I think I spent three days with them, something like that. And then, and then I, was, uh, uh, I went to uh, Camp Lejeune. Uh, and they wanted to send me on a med cruise. And I said, well, I gotta figure out how to get out of this. 
So I said, wait a second. Now I was a I was a, uh, a football player at Kentucky, and they went through the records. They said, yeah, you you were recruited before you went to Vietnam. And I said, yeah, but I didn't want to play any more football. I wanted to be a Marine officer and command men in combat. Now I'm ready to play football. Now I'm ready to play football because I don't want to go on a med cruise. I'd already been at war. I don't want to play it. Uh, you know, those helicopters, I mean, they're fragile. Uh, my understanding is this, this Marine Corps still flying CH-46s that we had in Vietnam. I don't know whether that's true, but that's what I've been told. Well, <clears> I think <throat> they've quit flying the H-34, the shuddering shithouse. Oh, i got to tell you a funny story about that if you want to go back. But uh, uh, So from there, I conned my way in, and they made me the 2nd Marine Division athletic officer. So I was, I was all the socks and the jocks and the shoes, and I ran the. Uh, yeah, that's right. I ran the regimental uh, sporting events, the football games, the basketball games. Made sure all the gyms were kept with the proper equipment. Went to Guantanamo Bay to make sure they were had all the proper equipment. Uh, so that's what I did. Then when it came around August, they called me and said, "Well, Lieutenant, are you are you ready to go uh, go out and play football?" I said, you know, sir, my knee is hurting me. I think I'm going to stay right here. So what I ended up doing is I was released early because it was time. I mean, they, they didn't need us any longer. All Marines were out of Vietnam by 1970 anyway. So uh, I said, no, I'll stay here. And I, <clears throat> I applied for graduate school. So I was released early to go to graduate school at uh, Louisiana State University. What were you going to study? Uh, uh, business administration. That's what my degree was in. And uh, from the University of Kentucky, mm -hmm. but I I'd met a lovely woman while I was at uh, Camp Lejeune, who was an East Carolina University student, and somehow, some way, I managed to convince her to marry me, oh my and uh, we will celebrate our 49th wedding anniversary in a couple of months. I don't know how I've been able to pull this up. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's mentally challenged for putting up with me for this long, but God bless her. Tell us that story about the H-34. Oh, yeah, the, the bubble thing out of the Korean War. So we were running up. Oh, the H-34 was at Sikorsky. It was a big humpback. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it, it was in the Korean War. It was an old yeah, helicopter. But, yeah, And uh, most of our operations were run with the CH-46. But this one operation was with those helicopters. So we're on the flight deck, and we're trying to take off. And the guy says, no, you got to kick. Well, I started out, it was me, my radio operator, a medic, and two uh, infantrymen. Well, that's a, that's a bad way to enter a, 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 an LZ anyway. Cause you, yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, that's what we did, because you could only get five minutes. Well, you got to kick somebody off. You got to kick somebody off. So I kicked off one of the infantrymen, because the helicopter couldn't get off the deck. It was 100, 105 degrees, and they said it couldn't get airborne. So we tried again. Couldn't get off the deck. Had to kick somebody else off. So now we start this operation off. It's me, my radio operator, and the, and the corpsman. And by the way, Marine Corps, they're corpsmen, not medics. My apologies yeah. to those men who did a fabulous job. Incredible people. Yes, yes indeed. Interviewed five corpsmen at the first Marine reunion this past year yeah. in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. And their stories just make your blood run yeah. cold, yeah. you know? They, just, they, they, they were still made. have their nightmares and see the faces of the ones they couldn't save yeah. 50 years later. Yeah, I can remember, like we talked about the bad times, but anyway, so, we take off. We finally get airborne, and we go into this operation. And, and the guy drops us right in a rice paddy. Well, we had to jump out. The rice paddy was wet. I, I didn't quite put all of that together. So I jumped out, and I swear I went, I went up to mid-calf or maybe even as far as my knees. Well, with all the weight on my back, I went face down in the mud. <laughs> so so the, the radio operator's kind of laughing, and I... Yeah, I, I get back up, you know, that kind of stuff, and I'm covered with mud. Yeah, and that's, I, a, I, that's I, an optimistic way of putting yeah, it. Yeah, 
I, I was just laughing. I said, boy, what the heck? <laughs> so anyway, that, that was one of the really light moments of that. And there was nobody around. We went up some doggone hill, and there, was, you do there were no bad guys. what they fertilized the rice fields uh, I was with. trying to avoid that, Joey. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. All right. When did you leave the Marine Corps? Uh, I left sometime in December. See, I was married in 71. 1970 is when I was released early. Uh, to, go to, to, to go to graduate school, and uh, the, the only unfortunate thing about it is the records were burned in that Kansas City fire. Uh, St. Louis. St. Uh, St. Louis, okay. Uh, I had been promoted to captain, but I couldn't put on my bars <clears throat> to sometime in the first week of January, 3rd, 4th, 5th, or 6th, and unfortunately, since I was getting out of the Marine Corps and I was glad to be able to get out of there alive, I kind of threw that letter away, and I wish I had kept it. Uh, but I never got to put on my bars. So I, uh, I left as a first lieutenant, went home for a while, uh, came back through, asked my, my girlfriend to marry me and on the way to LSU, and fortunately for me, she accepted. That's the story. Then I went to LSU for one semester, and I went with another buddy of mine from Camp Lejeune. We had been in the same basic school class, he was an engineering officer named Marty Becker, great guy. We, we were roommates there for three or four months. He'd actually been wounded in Vietnam. Uh, and we went to graduate school down there. And it wasn't the best of times to be at a college campus. Uh, it didn't, didn't face much abuse, but you could kind of tell that they kind of thought we were probably three quarters nuts. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't mingle that much, and we didn't have a whole lot of money anyway. The GI Bill didn't pay for a whole heck of a lot. Uh, so I wanted to get married. He wanted to go back to Rochester, New York. So we stayed one semester at LSU, and he went on to, I think he ended up running the Rochester Polytechnic Institute, all the engineering facilities of it. Mm. it was a good job, good, good man. And I went back and got married. And we stayed in Atlanta. We stayed in Atlanta, stayed right, right here. here. Uh, I had $400, and my wife had a job. And that's what made us stay right here. Mm. And we've never left. We have two wonderful children and five wonderful grandchildren. That's pretty good. Yep. Did you have any difficulty readjusting to civilian life after the Marines and the war? <clears throat> I don't believe so. Uh, you know, I thought about some things. Uh, you always think about some things. Even to this day, sometimes I'll see something when we're traveling in the mountains. Uh, how would I how would I get on that hill? Where would the helicopters land? You know, what would we do? But I don't have any have any real problems, and really never did. With uh, a couple of times, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and I I would think I was in some other place. But no, I didn't have much time. Uh, I didn't have a great deal of difficulty. Like I said, the, the, the Marines in 67 and, and Tet and all that kind of stuff, they, they did a lot of heavy lifting. Mm -mm -mm. So uh, my tour of duty wasn't as tough as probably some. But once you step out of the wire, you never know. Tomorrow's not promised to anyone in a combat zone. No, sure ain't. Have you maintained contact with guys you served with in Vietnam? Very little. Uh, the, the turnover, I think we had two, two officers killed and two officers wounded badly, so they weren't around very long. Uh, we operated as a company of three platoons, but m most of the time you were on your own as a platoon commander. I, you know, I was in left field, he was in right field, and the other guy was uh, was, was guarding the company's CP, and then we'd rotate around, so there wasn't that much inter interaction. Uh, I, I have some contact with uh, uh, one lieutenant who, who actually became the company commander after Jim Seal left. Uh, but he was only in Vietnam for six months. Uh, he got one of those Dear John letters. Uh, so th that's about it. I, I have some contact 
with one of my squad leaders. Uh, you know, we exchange Christmas cards or we'll call each other maybe on a Marine Corps birthday. Uh, we'll generally talk. But n not much. Not much. Not much, no. They, 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 it, they were in and out so fast, yeah. you know, getting wounded, getting rotated. It, Do you think your Vietnam experience changed you and affected <laughs> your life afterward for good or for <clears throat> less good? It, it was an experience that I wouldn't want to repeat, but at the same point in time, it was a priceless experience. Uh, commanding those young men in combat was, it, it was a privilege. Uh, it taught me, certainly taught me discipline. It, it taught me how to, you know, get to work, how to, how to really multitask, which unfortunately is not, I'm not so good at any longer, but uh, how to do a lot of things in a hurry. Uh, adjust on the fly. Uh, so it, it was a beneficial experience, yes, Don't the whole thing. Up because somebody may die. Yeah, that was, like I said, that was, that was the greatest fear I had, is if I did something really stupid and, and got young men killed. I, I don't believe I'd have been able to live too well with that, but fortunately I didn't. Your experience in combat affect the way you think about troops coming back from the wars today? Well, I, uh, these young people today have, as I understand it, multiple tours. Oh, eight, I, nine, I, ten deployments I mean, to that's, combat. I don't, I, I know they're all volunteers, all right? They but that's that's they cruel and unusual punishment. That's cruel and unusual that's, punishment. That's not right. Not right. Uh, you know, in, in Vietnam, uh, I probably wouldn't have gone back to Vietnam for two, two and a half years if I'd stayed in the Marine Corps. Uh, and that that that's the way it should be. These kids should not be rotating in for one year, then home for for uh, you know 120 days and going back to those godforsaken places. I did four. Okay. In Vietnam, yeah. and five other wars. I don't know how you could do that. I, I really don't. You have my undying admiration, but <laughs> it wouldn't be anything I was going to do. And, uh, I, I don't fully understand all of this PTSD. I mean, it, it seems like everybody's doing it. I don't. But but see. If you do four, five, six tours, I've never heard of the numbers that you're talking about. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's completely justified. I, well, I wouldn't want to have to walk those mountains yeah. and climb those hills and shoot shoot at everybody. Have people shooting at me four or five people times. People in Iraq and Afghanistan doing eight, nine, ten tours. Uh, Thirty percent PTSD rate among them. Well, that's much lower than what I thought. Uh, well, that, that may not be, you know, that may be optimistic army accounting. Well, okay. I, I have utmost sympathy and admiration for these young people who, who go over there and defend our That's the part that, that needs to be told more is the, uh, the families. And actually, my family never talked about it much. We never talked about it with my dad uh, getting, getting all shot up. Uh, we didn't talk about it at all when... You know, it's just something you did and you went on. Uh, you were expected to just move on. And that's what I did, Joey. Rightly or wrongly, that's what I did. So uh, I'm glad I did it, but I damn sure wouldn't want to do it again. do it again. No, no, no. How do you think the Vietnam War is remembered in our society today? Uh, unfortunately, I don't, I'm not even sure they teach it in the schools. But I'm sure as liberal as the schools are nowadays, it's looked upon as, as, as if we lost the war. And that's categorically untrue. And that doggone Walter Cronkite, when what he said on television was exactly wrong, Tet was an unbelievable military victory for the United States and its allies. They kicked the living you-know-what out of the, the NVA and the Viet Cong. And, uh, Politicians just, and I'm glad they did, just said, hey, no moss, we've had enough. No, we ain't going to do this no, no more. more. And, and we'd, we'd saved him in 72, 
uh, when the North Vietnamese, what what they get? They, didn't they get as far as uh, Dong Ha when they swept south and tried to overrun the country? I think they t they briefly took Quang Tri. Well, they may have. If they and then then we unleashed all the bombers and we just blew them moved away. In. But it, you know the the little people, the friendly little people, the the Arvin. My understanding is they lost forty thousand men that year. Uh, so at least they did stand and fight at that particular point in time. Well, uh, they put their best divisions up there. Yeah, and then they got they got like kind of decimated. They got decimated. Yeah, yeah, and but the, by that time, and that's the thing that bugs me. By that time, my understanding is all the ground forces of the United States were out of Vietnam. I think at the end of 1971, we were all gone. Nearly about. I think by, you know, there were... Advisors some The brigade somewhere. of the 1st Cavalry was still in country. Uh -huh. They were among the last to leave in early 73. Okay. And see, that you just told me something I didn't know. I thought everybody was out sometime in 72. No. But then Saigon didn't fall until what, April of 75? 75. So we were gone. So I'm still trying to figure out how we lost the war. I've never been able to understand that. And then... Well, it infuriates me, to be honest with you. The purpose of going there, according to the President Johnson, we're not here to defeat North Vietnam. We're here to support South Vietnam and maintain it as a democracy. Hmm. Well, How'd that work out? We failed that. Yeah. If that's your margin of victory, okay. we didn't get there. Okay. We spent a lot enough. of money and a lot of lives, no. and uh, and in the end, the other guys won. Not exactly directly our defeat, but in the end, it's in our back pocket. Okay. I, I, well, then I guess I'm going to have to alter my opinion, but I wouldn't want them to think that the American military lost the war, because that's just categorically untrue. Yeah. It was a stupid way to fight a war. Why in God's name would you fight a war and give somebody sanctuary in Laos and Cambodia? Why would you say, okay, we're not going north of the, uh, the Ben Hai River? Why would you do individual replacements instead of units? Units. Yeah, that's Why a good point, too. Why would you pull a successful battalion commander out of the field after six months when he's just really learned the job? Yeah. Yeah. And has become his most effective, and you put him in some pogue job in headquarters yeah. so some other guy can get his ticket punched. Yeah. Yeah. It's Learn insane. Yeah. And the yeah. enemy, his enlistment terms was victory or death. Yeah. For them, it was just like World War II. They yeah. fought to the end. We ain't going anywhere till it's over yeah. and done, yeah. or we're dead. And then we've got this god awful situation now with Afghanistan and Iraq. Oh well, we better not go there because we'd we be here all not night. Go there. Have you? Is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to talk about? Now's the last shot. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'll think of something when I leave. But for right now, uh, I, I I think we covered it all. I just wanted you to. Understand that uh, the young Marines I had the privilege command, they were good. They they overwhelmingly did their job, and, and I'm very proud of them. Uh, you visited, I'm very proud of my service. You visited the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. In oh yeah, I sh yeah, I shed more than a few tears that, oh. especially the first time was, that was tough. It's gotten a little bit easier, and actually now, Joey, you're not may not aware of it, but you know the traveling Vietnam War Memorial. Yeah. That's going to be located right out where I live. Uh, its permanent place will be in uh, uh, out there in Johns Creek. Hmm. And is there park a there. museum or something that's sponsored? Uh, well, we're yeah, and uh, but that'll all get done, as I understand it, sometime this year. Hmm. So they that's have a that's pretty permanent good. display of one of those at the National Infantry Museum down at Benning. Was not aware of that. Yeah, <clears throat> that's uh, they they bought it off of whoever built it. 
mm-hmm. and it's a permanent installation there. That's good. That's if you've good. never visited that museum, you should. It's outstanding. Yeah, I visited the National uh, uh, Marine Corps Museum yeah. in Quantico, Yeah. but I've not been to the one uh, that, that you're talking about. That one's worth spending a day down there. They got a good restaurant for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to do that, Joey. You've heard about the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War commemoration. You're part of it today. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of that? Well, I must admit I had a few cocktails uh, on uh, about September 15th, uh, 2019, my 50th anniversary of leaving that godforsaken place. Yeah. And... Uh, I think I had a few in early September 1968 when I first went into that godforsaken place. But uh, it it sh- it should be commemorated. We're we're like the Korean War guys. We're we're kind of forgotten. Uh, Have you think. been given your lapel pin, your veteran lapel pin? Veteran lapel pin? I, obviously we not, because I don't know what it this. is. It, it, you know, when my dad and his six brothers and my mother's four brothers came back from World War II, they wore what they called the ruptured duck, which was a discharge pin that the military gave them as they left. And it was a flying eagle with a little white enamel circle around it. And if you didn't have one of those on your lapel in 1946, you couldn't get elected dog catcher. And so we thought the Vietnam veterans deserved their own lapel pin, and huh. we created one. I've never seen got or heard the, of this. It's got the eagle on the front, uh-huh. but more importantly, on the back is engraved these words, a grateful nation thanks and honors you. Huh. So... If you'll stand up, I'll put um, it on you. Well, I'll, try, I'll try not to make it a blood stick for either one of us. Yeah, well, I don't have to take eloquence any longer, so <laughs> I won't bleed. <laughs> you won't bleed to death. <laughs> all right, if I can get this. That's always the problem. I just dropped yeah. the damn thing down there. <laughs> Hold on a second, George. I know it's in there. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Well, there it is. There it is. I hope you're not filming this. Oh, she <laughs> is. <laughs> All right. You got it? There We're going to try this again. Okay. And I think I'll move it to somewhere over here where it's not. If it falls, it'll hit the floor and I can get it. All right. I'm not as dexterous as I Neither used to I. be when I was shooting cameras and yeah. much younger. I have uh, there we a are. difficult time getting these button-down collars. Oh, it getting the button me. through there, I have to sit down and negotiate with my fingers to be I, able to get me it through. Me too. Anymore. <laughs> I'm gonna give up wearing the damn things. That's what I should do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks it's, it's for your service. It's a pleasure to meet you. My pleasure. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in, sir. My pleasure. I appreciate it. Uh,